So we're using Sean Terrence's computer. So it's like an evil for good. <laughs> right. Um, let's get started, right? My name's Jonathan Vakara. I run the blog Fluent C++, and I work at Murex as a C++ developer. Been doing that for six years. What keeps me up at night is searching how to write expressive code in C++. By expressive code, I mean code that when you read it, you understand the intent of the person who wrote it. And I think that's the most desirable technical characteristic of a piece of code, and more generally of a code base for its survival. Expressive code is code that pretty much anyone can understand. One way to go about that is putting names over things, right? Putting eloquent names. Today, we're going to see a way to put names over data in particular in code. And we're going to do that with strong types. What we're going to see today, you can use it in your code to make it more expressive. The journey I'll be proposing to you is starting with a motivating example that will get us to what strong types are and how they can be useful. And then we'll see a generic implementation of strong types. So far, that would be quite classical work. And after that, I'd like to show some practical issues that come up in C++ code when we use strong types, like passing them around as references, or doing strong typing over types we don't know, like lambdas, for example, or why and how we would reuse functionalities from the underlying type we're doing strong typing over. And we'll finish with the dreaded question about strong type, which is how much do they cost in terms of performance? And then we'll have questions at the end to make sure we finish on time. All right? Let's dive in. So we start with restarting this presentation. Right, right. So I was about to tell you a story. It's the story of a circle. A happy little circle class that lives in a happy circle world and you can build it from a radius and change the radius, and it does what a circle is supposed to be doing, like giving its area, giving its perimeter, that kind of thing. All goes well until there's a major disruption in this life of a circle, and we have a new requirement, which is to be able to build this circle from a diameter, which makes sense, right? But the thing is, this code, Adding a new constructor doesn't compile, right? Because there, there are two constructors that have the same prototype, so it's ambiguous, right? So we are going to try and solve that problem. Before we do that, it's interesting to note that we don't have the problem with the setters, right? I could add a setter, set diameter, without having conflict. So what's the difference between a setter and a constructor is that the setter has a name. And that's the whole thing about it. Before we get to strong types, we'll um, show just two other alternatives, just for the sake of comparison. The first one is using the builder pattern. By builder pattern, I mean um, a class that has setters that you can chain up. So every setter set a value and returns a reference to the object itself. You can chain them up. Right, and build the thing progressively. You can take the thing out of the builder or use the class to do the whole, the whole thing. So if we do that, we have setters in instead of constructors, and that thing works. But it has drawbacks. Like, probably, when you, we do build a pattern, if 
there are things that have to be in a circle, like, I don't know, a radius and a color and a thickness or whatever. Well, we can only check that it's complete at runtime, right? Probably. Whereas if we forgot one, it's a programming error. Also, depending on the implementation, we may have a copy in CAD, just for the sake of saying what we're talking about. Another solution is using tag dispatching, which is more idiomatic in C++. So by tag dispatching, I mean creating a type that's there just for the sake of being there. has no data, no behavior, and it's just there for having a name. And we use this tag in a constructor. So this tag is called radius, and another tag is called diameter. We use that in the constructor. We've got two different constructors, and problem is solved. However, it's a bit bizarre at call sites. And even more so, if there, if, if there are several parameters. And really, when you think about it, you don't want to double up the number of parameters just for the sake of saying what you're talking about, right? So in this particular case, tag dispatching is all right, but not that good. Which gets us two strong types. So the idea of strong typing is creating a new type that represents the data we're talking about. So here, radius was a double, and diameter was also a double. And now we're creating two new types, a type radius and a type diameter, which can do pretty much the same thing. Like You can retrieve a double from radius and retrieve a double from diameter. But we use them in constructor, and there are two different types, and they disambiguate. So that leads us to a definition of strong type. So a strong type is a type that we use instead of another type for the purpose of adding some meaning through its name. When we look at them, we can see that they're terribly similar. And this scream for being generalized, and this is exactly what we're going to do now. So the idea is to take what's in common between radius and between diameter, and there's a lot in common, and do something generic out of that, to do strong typing. So if, before we do that, I want to mention that this is completely not new. This, there has been a popular topic in the C++ community in particular over the past years, and there has been, have been libraries and even even proposal to the standard to implement strong typing in various ways. So this is something important, right? Let's get to code. So if we take radius and diameter, put that in common, this is about what it is, right? Except there's a new constructor that takes our values and a get that deals with contentness. But the idea is to have a something that encapsulates the data behind a name and gives access to that data. I'm calling this named type because that, that's the point of it. Let's use that for our radius and diameter. So radius is a double, but with a name, radius. And diameter is a double, but with a name, diameter. And if we stop here, then it's all for nothing. We're back to square one, because radius and diameter become the same type, which is what we wanted to prevent in the first place. So ha we, we need something to differentiate two name types over the same generic double type. One way to go about that is using phantom types. So a phantom type is a type that's there just for the sake of being there, but you don't use it. It's a bit like a phantom, because it's there, but you can't see it. And with this additional parameters, which is a tag to say which type we're talking about, we can go back to our usage and create a new type saying this is a radius, 
a new start to say name type of a double and this is a radius. Now, there's something that's pleasant in the C++ syntax here is that we don't have to define a type to use it in an alias. We can just declare it, which allows us to create a strong type in just one line of code, which is nice. There's one particular case where it's useful. It's in function interfaces. Imagine that you have an interface like that one that takes two integers. So you say that's something related to UI that sets something in a table that has rows and columns. And, and so the first parameters is a, supposed to be a row. The second one's a column. So when I read that code, it's at row number two or column number one. When, when we're reading code that, that uses that, we, we don't really know, do we? Maybe it's column, column two in row one. And we can get that wrong. I mean, I can get that wrong, I promise. That's a good case for strong types, I think. Because they give a meaning to every parameters. Right? The first one is a row, the second one is a column, and a row is a different thing from a column. It has a different meaning in that context. And at call site, it's really nice, because we're seeing that we're passing a row, which is two, and a column, which is one. Or it's, you, you, you could argue that we can look it up. Like, if we don't use strong types here, we can still look up the definition and we'll see which one is which. But if we get to look up every definition, every function that we read, it would take like half a day to read 50 lines of code. <laughs> so I think there's a case for it. And in this particular case, we cannot get that wrong. I mean, if I get that wrong, there's probably something else that's wrong with me. So this line of code is supposed to be more expressive thanks to strong types, which makes us think about what it is, expressive code. So I said at the beginning that expressive code is code that you can read and understand the intent of the person who wrote it. So when you write code and try and make it expressive, who are you making that for? Well, First, to make it for other developers, right, that are going to read that piece of code and understand what you meant. And there's somebody else, which is just as important, is the compiler. Because using the type system here expresses our intentions to the compiler that will stop us when we don't respect our intentions by mixing up the order of the parameters, for example. Although, I'm not saying that you should invest too much type, time in a relationship with your compiler. Because it's a program, right? not a human being. But you get the idea. So this is a generic way of doing strong typing in C++. But when we actually use it, there are plenty of questions that rise up. And one of them is, how to use that with references. And before that, we're going to see one example of usage, which is units. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on units because it's, not, it's just one particular case of strong types, but I want to show something that has to do with syntax. So a unit is a good case for a strong type, I think, because when you think about a particular unit like like meter, for example, if you go like five meters, it's five, the number, but it's meters, right? So you'd like to know that this five has a meaning of being meters. So it's a case for strong types. There's something nice in C++, starting with C++11, which is user-defined literals. So we can use a literal to define a strong type that represents a unit. And if we use that in 
any code that uses this strong type. So we have, say, a rectangle that takes a width and a height, and both have a unit, like, for example, meters. Well, we get to a syntax that's fairly pleasant to the eye, I think. It looks a bit like English. I mean, it's not English, but it's more English -like than average C++. Right, I'm, I'm closing the parenthesis about units to get to references. So, let's look at our name type thing. Imagine we're passing an L value, like an object that has a name. We're passing it to a function, and this function accepts a strong type. And we're constructing a strong type for the sake of that function. When we look at that, it's clear that it makes a copy. Right? It makes a copy and stores that copy inside of the name type, which can be OK, but it has two implications. The first one is that we're going to pay for a copy, and we may not want that, because passing thing to a function by reference should not make a copy. And the second thing is that we won't be able to bind to what the function receives. Now, is it a good thing for a function to do a binding on the parameter? It doesn't sound like a good thing, but in some cases it can be useful. Here's one example. So this back inserter is in the STL, so it's an output iterator. So you can use it in an algorithm such as this one, transform, and its job is to plug onto a container, and when the algorithm writes outputs to its iterator, this one actually push backs it, the value inside of the container. Right? So this line of code takes the value of v2, multiplies them by 2, and add, as appends the results at the end of, the, of v1. And when you look at what back inserter is doing, well, it's taking a container, like a vector, something you can do pushback on, and it returns a smart iterator that's bound to that particular vector. And imagine that we wanted to do strong typing over that vector. Well, that wouldn't work with back inserter, right? Because that would make a copy, and back inserter would bind to that copy, push thing into it, the copy would be thrown away, and that's all for nothing. So we would, like, we would want to have strong types compatible with references. How do we go about that? And more generally, when we pass things in C++ to function, the general case is to pass by reference to const. So const is OK with this implementation, because we have a get function that returns a reference to const. So you won't be able to call a non-const method on it. But for references, if we just pass the const reference of a strong type, it won't do the right thing. Because it will make a copy, store it into the strong type, and throw that copy away. So how do we go about that? One way to go about it, and I started that with this, is creating a new type of name type, if I may say. One that's made for references, right? So it knows it's a reference, it takes a reference, stores a reference, gives a reference. Which works, but has a drawback of creating a new name type, which is not as nice as having one that does a generic thing. But I received feedback on that library, very good feedback actually, and one of those pieces of feedback was giving an idea of using name type on a reference, so how does it look like? Say we want to do a strong typing over a string for representing the first name of somebody. Right? It's not just a string, it's the first name of somebody. And we want to pass that to a function that accepts the first name of somebody. If we do a name type on a reference, Let's see what it looks like. So, T is a reference, 
like string wrap, for example. And so there's no copy, and we bind on the reference, and, and it's all good. But the thing in this doesn't compile. It doesn't compile because of reference collapsing. So the first constructor, say t is uref, the first constructor takes a uref const ref, which collapses in uref. The second one takes a uref ref ref, which collapses into uref as well. So it's ambiguous. How do we deal with that? One way to go about that is to just get rid of the second constructor when t is a reference. We don't even need it in that, in that case. How do we get rid of something in C++? Of that kind of thing, we can use fine. So let's fine in something. How lovely does that look? <laughs> oh, I've, I've highlighted the important thing in orange. So enable the, that thing only if T is in reference. I watched a CPPCon talk from just a couple of weeks ago from Stephen Dewurst that showed how to put Sphino in code and so that it's not disgusting. So I'm not going to get into details, but it's pretty straightforward to write it this way. Anyway, either way, this is not visible from the call site, from the user of name type, but that solved the problem of passing name types by reference, which is really important. Let's get that into an example to see how this looks like in code, because it looks particular. So uh, say I'm using this first name strong type. I want it to be a reference. So I'm doing a name type on a reference. So this name type is a name type over a reference. So I'm calling it first name ref. What that means is first name ref, but the ref with the ampersand. But it reads ref ref. At call sites, so I've got the, the first name of somebody, and I'm passing that to your function. The ref shows. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? I think it depends. If it's a reference to const, then it's probably not a good thing, because the meaning of reference to const, const is being input. So I'm passing this first name as input. I don't care, it's a reference. So I don't think it's a good thing that it shows. It's too bad. However, if it's a non-const reference, then it could be a good thing because it shows at call side that this thing can be modified by the function. Some people go a long way to make that show at call site by, say, passing a pointer just for the sake of taking the address or something. So it's it's subjective, I think. That could be a good thing or a bad thing. Right. So now we can pass types by reference, the type that we know. How about passing type we don't know as strong types? Let's see one example. So this example. I, I actually ran into it when coding something related to the STL. I wanted to merge two sets together and aggregate the elements that had the same key together. So I had to pass an aggregator function. And just like any set algorithm, you can pass a comparator custom function. So at the end of the day, this function takes two functions, one to aggregate and one to compare. So I've, I've taken away everything that's related to the STL, because that's not the point here for today. We want to focus on the strong type aspect of the thing. But when you see that code, you, you see that the fun two functions are passed by templates, and they don't really show anything about them apart from the name of the variable. So at call site, I could call the, the perform job function 
with the right arguments or call it with the wrong arguments. And depending on the, on the type of the function, this could compile. One example, if imagine you have two sets of integers, and so you have an aggregator that takes an in and an int and returns an int, and the comparator takes an int and an int and returns a bool, then you can swap them around and it compiles just fine. But it doesn't work just as fine. So this is an issue of passing the parameters in the right type, and it comes down to being explicit in the interface about which is the meaning of each of the parameters. So it really sounds like a job for strong types. So let's imagine that we do a strong type on, on, on these guys, like on comparator, for example. How would we write that? Like using comparator equals namespace of and that's the lambda. And we don't know the type of the lambda, right? So how do we go about that? It took me a while, uh, a, a long time of pondering over that question. And at some point, I realized it was really simple. When you look, when you look at it this way, the name type is a template itself. In all the previous cases, we special that template with a string or with an int or whatever, but we can keep it this way, like a template. So we'd have a template strong type on the first parameter, but with a tag that says the meaning of it. This is a comparator. So since we can't instantiate it, because we don't know the type of the lambda, we need a helper function, which is like the typical thing with template programming before C17. And we can do the same thing with aggregator and have an interface that has both and that shows what it expects. This interface clearly expects a comparator for its first argument and a, an aggregator for its second argument. At call sites, it looks a bit like the row and column example we had before. So we're, we're stating what it is we're talking about. We're being expressive. This first parameter I'm, I'm passing over to you is a comparator. The second one is an aggregator. And if we mix them up, it doesn't compile because it uses the type system. The type comparator instantiated on that particular lambda is not the same as the type aggregator. Okay, so this works for comparator and aggregator, but it, it looks a bit more generic than that. So we could use that for any function, right? Or any generic type for that matter. So let's try to draw what's in common between all that and, and see if we can make that generic. So comparator and aggregator are strong types, and we already have made name type generic. What's left is that function that makes a comparator and one that makes an aggregator. And we just want to see what's in common with those two and, and draw something generic out of that. Which leads us to that make named function. So it takes a template, template parameter, which is the name type. So for example, the strong type parameter here would be comparator, which is a template, right? And the second one would be the lambda. And let's use that at call sites. And, and this is a generic make name comparator. This is a comparator and so on. So this is before C++ 17. But in C++17, there's this type deduction for constructors. So can we use that here and get rid of make named like we got rid of make pair? Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. Because type deduction for that kind of thing doesn't work on aliases. It only works on actual types. And Comparator is an alias for name types. It doesn't work. Whatever. 
Okay, so now we can do strong typing over things, including lambdas and generic thing. There's a an important question about strong typing in general. So our strong type doesn't do much, right? It has a constructor and it has a getter, and that's about it. Now, do we want it to do more than that? Do we want it to be to do just as much as what the underlying type is doing? At first, I didn't think so. I didn't think that was a good idea because I thought it would bring just more complexity. But then I saw an example that changed my mind. This example is Chrono. So in another, in another CppCon talk by Howard Hinnant, he showed how Chrono was designed and he clearly showed that Chrono is using strong types all over the place. So in Chrono, there are types like as, minutes, seconds, types that represent time, durations, which are essentially ints. Although you can tweak them into floats or whatever, but essentially they're just ints with a name. And in Chrono, you want to be able to write this. You want to be, you want to be able to add seconds just like you would add integers. You don't want to do one second dot get bracket bracket plus two seconds dot get bracket bracket wrap that back into a strong type or something. You don't want that, right? So there is a case for inheriting functionalities from the underlying type. How do we do that? And do we also, so how do we do that? And do we want it all the time? Like an integers can, can do a million things. You can add them, you can multiply them. Do you want to multiply seconds? Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't. In Chrono, you can't. In some physics library, you can. So the idea is that you have to make a choice. You have to be able to make a decision whether or not you, you take on some functionalities and which one you're taking. So one way to go about that is working on the interface of name type. So this is a name type of anything like length, that's the double with the name, which is length. And say that we want to have some capacities coming from double, like being addable or printable or something like that. One way to, to, to express that in code is to add that kind of skills to the declaration of length, right? So this is supposed to read length is a double but with a name which is length and you can add them like you, like you can add doubles, you can print them out like you can print doubles and you can hash them to put them in a stood in order map, map or set, like a double. So that, that's the main thing to take away, I think. We're going to go into how to implement that, but I think that's the main idea, is to be declarative. To pick and choose which functionalities we take. Now, how do we implement that? Let's, let's get into it, just, just for pleasure. So one way to do that is using CRTP. You see CRTP is made for adding functionalities to your class, like adding shared functionalities, like addable is, can be used by many things, including this particular type length, right? So that's a natural to do it via CRTP. Now there are several, potentially several skills to add, so that would be a variadic CRTP, right? So inheriting for several from several skills and passing ourselves, our type inside every every one of them. How would the skill look like? It would look like a CRTP thing, right? So we would have the static cast thing to retrieve the, va the, the value of the object that's below, which is our strong type. And the point of it, it would be to add opera operators, for example, like operator plus, 
operator. Times some operators are outside of the class, like the stream operator. So you need some connection with the class, like you have a print thing, which is like a classical thing. Let's get into hashable. So how do we hash something? Not particularly a uh, strong type, but how do we hash something in C++? So we have to define this hash uh, structure in the std namespace, and it has this interface, right? And so we'd like to hash a name type the same way that we would hash the underlying type, right? So we call std hash on the underlying type. Now, we want to make that an opt-in. So when it's a way to connect that with our name type and to enable it on demand. Well, there's a simple way to do that. It's just to declare something in the name type and connect that with Sphene inside of the hash. So this is a skill that name type inherits from. And the enable if activated or doesn't activate it. So this allows a name type to get into an, an ordered set. Now there's a controversial skill. So when you think about it, a name type, to use the value inside it, you have to call .get. And this has been annoying to some people. Got feedback like that. Some people would like to pass a name type to a function that expects an underlying type. And some don't. So you want to make that an opt-in as well. So this skill is just converting a strong type into its underlying type, right, by reference, because we want, we want it itself. So this allows us to write that kind of code. So you've got a function that takes a double, and you can pass a name type that's either a double. Do we want that? Or if you, if you like it, you can use it. If you don't like it, you don't have to use it. If you have an opinion about why you like it or don't like it, let's talk. Similarly, we can call methods on a strong type. Well, one way to do that is to use the arrow operator, because there's no such thing as a there's no such thing as a dot operator, and call a method. And we can combine, uh, we can combine um, skills together, like method and function being callable in general. Right. This leads us to the dreaded question about strong types. Say, say that you buy into strong typing and you think that this will make your code more expressive, and I do think it will, how much does this cost? How much performance do I have to pay for all this machinery of strong typing? So, like everyone, I got bolted the thing. <laughs> so this is the use case, so I've got a rectangle that does strong types and a rectangle that doesn't do strong type, right? One takes double, the other one takes the width and the height. And I'm using that in a test harness that just builds a rectangle. Let's see what's the generated code. So we're not going to get into every line of it, but what we can see is that it's exactly the same code. So there's no cost. That's, that's the holy grail of modern C++. There's zero cost abstraction. We're basking in the glory of modern C++. Except this was compiled with O2. How does it look like in O1? There's a difference. That was Clang. Let's see how it looks like with GCC. No difference. Without any optimization, oh, there's a difference, obviously. There's no magic. Now, the question is, does this difference matter? Or 
first of all, if you're compiling with enough optimization, there's no difference. It's free, right? Free lunch. Now, if, you, if you're not, and there is a difference, does it matter? Well, you know, there's this 80-20 rule, some even say 90-10 rule, that says that 90% of the time is spent in 10% of the code. So, in a, any given place in your code, it's probably not going to matter. An extra copy will probably not matter. However, what's a hundred percent sure is that it, it will make a difference for every person who reads it. Every person who reads that line of code, if you use strong types, will see your intent. Right, we're nearing the end of it. Before I let you go, just a couple of words. First of all, everything, all the code that you've seen is available for use on GitHub. You're more than welcome to use it and to provide feedback, either on the code or how you use strong types or what you think about those ideas. Do you agree, dis disagree? I'm eager to know. If you want to get in touch to get feedback, you can find me on Twitter at Che Bukhara. And you, if you're interested in the topic of strong type, which is such a deep topic, and on expressive code in general in C++, I spend most of my spare time writing about that on Fluent C++. So you're welcome to go and we can, you can get in touch through the blog as well. So put names over data in code, and you can use the type system for that to make your code more expressive. Thank you. So we've got time for questions. Have we got questions? There's a question at the back here. Uh, so what are the problems that has uh, prevented this from getting into the standard previously? And it's is it up again for C20 to, to add it natively so we can avoid the ref names like you had? So you're saying that there are things that prevent that from getting... You said earlier that there's been suggestions up. Uh, you, you mentioned like multiple times people have tried to get this into C++. And I was just wondering, like, why didn't it get into C++ 11 or 14 or 17? And would it get into 20? And would it get in there as a standard library or as a like, native feature? I could imagine if it was a native feature, you could avoid the problem you had with reference uh, on the name, you could be in real episode and stuff like that. Right, it's a great question. I don't know why those particular proposal did not get into the standard. I, I, well, they, this proposal I've, I've shown in prior art were different. I don't know for those particular proposal why they didn't get into the standard. This one I've showed, I haven't proposed it anywhere, so it didn't get anywhere. Any other question? Yeah, Bjorn. Uh, oh, yeah. No yeah. Uh, actually, not a question. I have an observation to your last few slides on performance. Yep. Um, I, too, have done god bolting on similar uh, constructions, and I have seen negative costs. Because you can, when you have functions that take pointers to distinctly different types, the compiler knows that they are not allowed to be aliased, so it can generate more efficient code. Right. So negative coast. It's even better than zero coast. That's, that's the future. <laughs> Thank you. Did you check the compile time overhead if you use that at a large scale? So if you nest classes with using your type system, and you, I think it blows your header file or not. So the question is, how, what's the impact on compile time? Compile time. Right. Large-scale software, so it's not about using one type at one point. You need to nest it. Right, because our nested type class to build off strong types, and you use it in the largest scenario. Right. So since there are nested types, does it have an impact on compile time? Is that the question? Yes. Okay. Well, I've used that sparingly in code, like I would like used any struct or class function, and I didn't notice anything, but I didn't measure. A, an intensive usage of local strong types. So for that, I don't know. But that's not the point. The point is to use that in business code, like you'd use any structure class. Maybe I can uh, add to that. 
Here. Yeah. Uh, yep. Um, I'm working on a large system, and we are using um, techniques like that. And in our experience, it it has all the benefits you presented, but um, the drawbacks are uh, the debug info, uh, information is getting huge, and the compiler is using much more time if you use it on a large code base in, in many places. So that that excuse me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, um, we also use uh, like template metaprogramming he heavily and uh, we have gigabytes of PDB files with every build and that's okay. getting uh, a bit annoying because uh, uh, the Visual Studio uh, debugger is crashing because the PDBs right. are too big and um, yeah, so it's, um, uh, it, I guess what would help is uh, a proposal to the standards committee to allow for a selective RTTI. So mm. we could switch off uh, RTTI for those um, helper classes and um, also, uh, well, um, improving the, uh, the tool chain to cope with um, mm. these mechanics in a better way. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, the proposal was about opaque type defs, uh, and uh, what, uh, would, the, would opaque type defs handle all these cases? Uh, so, uh, there would be no more debug info, that's one. No more what? There would be no more, I didn't quite hear. And, uh, well, uh, there wouldn't be any problems with debug info with opaque type defs, at least. What kind of problems would be related to that for debugging? Well, he just says, so using uh, excessive... Oh, right, that, okay. Okay, so what's the question? So what about opaque type diffs? Would these, uh, like, handle all your use cases f for uh, uh, strong types? I'm very sorry, I didn't quite get the question. So you're talking about compile time, right? Yes, so opaque type diffs. Open? It's opaque. Opaque. So Type def int yeah, yeah. length. Yeah. So uh, today length is just an int, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, with opaque type def, length wouldn't be an int. It would be a length. Yeah. Would that, uh, that would handle all use cases for strong types, right? Yeah, that would be use case for strong types, yeah. So the proposal was about opaque type defs. Why, wasn't, why was it shut down? Why wasn't it... Uh, so you're asking the why the proposal was turned down? Yes. I don't know that. Okay. The, the, the proposal that I mentioned in prior art, right? Yes. Yeah, that one in particular, I looked it up, but I don't know why it was turned down, no. Oh, yeah, so... Um, I mean, I love this idea and everything. Uh, how do you pitch this to C programmers that are like coming to C++ because I meet them and it's very hard for me to like um, sell this to them, let's say, like that they should write this kind of code. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So how do we how sell? do we pitch this? How do we sell this to like people that are still used to uh, old standards and that are coming maybe from a C, C background? Well, there's well, the use case that's really common to get wrong is when you have several parameters in a function that have the same type and you mix them up. That happens. So that's the source of a bug. So this is an argument for typing things. Also, there are other cases like returning several things out of a function. You can return a tuple of strong types and then you stood get with the type. So it gives a way to return several things out of a function and contrary to structure bindings, make sure that you have them in the right order, for example. So that's another use case. Also, generally, when I show that kind of, um, of code when you see like set position row is two and colon is one, Usually, people like that kind of code. So that's, normally that's an easy way to convince people to use strong types. 
Oh, yeah? I'll, I'll try to think about more and uh, can get in touch. Yeah. A great talk, by the way. Thanks. Um, I was, you mentioned in passing adding uh, hashability as uh, an optional skill to a name type. Uh, I was thinking, uh, what were your thoughts on, I very much like uh, Howard Hinnon's uh, take on um, uh, hash combine for aggregate types. Uh, don't know if you've seen his talk at CPPCon a few years back. Um, he, he has a very interesting technique of uh, combining hashes for aggregate types. I was just wondering if you thought about that and how I, it plays with your uh, name type uh, prototype. I didn't, but I will. <laughs> so, uh, check out his uh, CPP con talk from um, two or three years back. Okay. It's very interesting. I'll be sure to do that. Thank you. Jonathan. Um, so regarding the strong opaque type diff proposal, I was also interested in the status and I wrote the author. He said it was rejected due to strong opposition in the committee but couldn't give me any more specific reason. And he said that if someone w would have implemented it in a compiler, then this topic can be rediscussed but not before that. So if you want them, write a cl for Clang and write an implementation of them and then it can be brought uh, in front of the committee again. Okay. Yeah, uh, proof of concept. Thanks for the comment. Anyone question? All right, thanks for coming.